2023 has been a watershed year at the box office. After almost two decades of dominance, it's looking more and more like capes are out and just about everything else is back in. But this seismic shift in the market goes far beyond mere superhero fatigue or even general IP fatigue for that matter. Audiences have simply become more discerning when it comes to the movies they spend their money on. Whether it's because movies are being dropped on streaming and home media way quicker than they used to or the higher cost cost of living in years following the pandemic has made consumers a little more selective when visiting the theater, audience behavior has changed almost overnight and resulted in an unpredictable year at the box office. Make no mistake, folks are still turning out for the films based on pre-existing IP, but those films have had to really stand out to put butts in seats. One of the biggest draws has seemingly been the promise of a bold artistic vision. Films like Barbie, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and Spider-Verse have thrived by promising to be something more than your run-of-the-mill franchise fare, each one highly stylized and brimming with personality. Coinciding with this shift in audience appetite has been the return of the monster movie. I don't know if you've noticed, but Godzilla is back. After years of tepid enthusiasm for Legendary's MonsterVerse, Godzilla vs. Kong became one of the most successful theatrical releases during the pandemic, while Apple TV's Monarch is being heralded as an unexpected triumph of premium television. And now we have Godzilla Minus One, a dark, meditative return to the radioactive lizard's roots. And I don't think the resurgence of this 75-year-old franchise in this particular cultural moment is a coincidence, because in a way, the Godzilla films have come to exemplify exactly the kind of franchise filmmaking audiences are craving. Reigning as the longest continuous-running film franchise in the world, Godzilla should be the epitome of the kind of corporate conveyor belt filmmaking audiences rejected this year. For God's sake, there are 38 films in the Japanese series alone, but somehow, it isn't. Sure, there was a time when Toho was pumping these films out to turn a quick profit, but over time, the series has evolved into something more, settling into its legacy status and becoming one of the most interesting and ambitious film franchises around. While the American-led legendary series harkens back to the pulpy fun of Godzilla's Showa era, albeit with a much larger budget, the Toho-led projects of late have taken a more filmmaker-driven approach. Enlisting the talents of some of Japan's finest filmmakers, each new iteration of the series has reinvented Godzilla and his world to reflect the particular vision of the storyteller. This is evident in 2016's brilliant Shin Godzilla, which radically reworked the character right down to his physiology to tell a harrowing story concerning the Japanese government's lethargic response to the Fukushima meltdown disaster. So it's perhaps unsurprising that not even the one inch tall barrier of subtitles could extinguish the hype for Godzilla Minus One, which has become one of the highest rated films of the year and the highest grossing Japanese film ever released in North America. Beyond its jaw-dropping special effects and downright epic scope and scale, Minus One's success can ultimately be traced down to its emotional core. Any assembly line can produce cheap thrills, but it takes an artist to capture emotional truth. And Minus One is brimming with emotional truth thanks to the vision of director, writer, and VFX supervisor Takashi Yamazaki. A soul-crushing meditation on national trauma and survivor's guilt, this is as much a story about Japan reclaiming its national identity post-World War II as it is a glorious spectacle of destruction. Godzilla Minus One can't help but feel like a victory lap for a transformative year at the box office, a film that fully embodies the changing tide of audience preferences. Let's wind the clocks back to 1945 and examine why this particular kaiju movie is quite possibly the best Godzilla movie ever made. But before we do, this video is sponsored by Ipsos Isei. Ipsos Isei is a survey-based company that wants your personal and extremely valuable opinion on very various topics in exchange for gift card rewards you can use to buy your favorite things, like a new Godzilla Minus One figure to add to your collection of Godzillas. Who wouldn't want this lovely thing on their shelf? Whether you use it to destroy model cities or sit on a shelf, you can purchase your mini monster using gift cards earned through surveys 
on Ipsos I Say. You can take part in surveys by answering simple questions and earn rewards for doing so. I personally like the Visa gift cards because it gives me the freedom to spend my rewards wherever I please. So say I didn't want that Godzilla figure, I could go to Target or Best Buy and buy steelbooks, Blu-rays, 4Ks, you know, all that stuff because I'm a movie lover. And actually the most recent thing I did with my saved rewards was use them to purchase a record player I've had my eye on from Amazon not too long ago. The best part about it is that these surveys are tailored to my interest, so I never get bored. Plus, they're so easy. I can fill them out whenever I have free time, like when I'm at the gym training for an inevitable kaiju attack. I can curl in one hand and tell Ipsos I Say my opinions in the other. And thank you so much again to Ipsos I Say for sponsoring today's video. Now. Back to Godzilla. The thing that immediately stands out about Godzilla Minus One is that it's a period piece. Despite the fact Godzilla is so intrinsically tied to the atrocities committed against Japanese civilians at the end of the Second World War, its films seldom revisit this period, instead opting to move forward with time, sometimes even going far off into the future. And while it makes sense to keep the series in a contemporary setting, it feels like a missed opportunity that the series has never gone full period piece until now. Opening in the final days of the war, Minus One follows a group of war veterans, each struggling with the sacrifices they made or didn't make while fighting an unwinnable war. You could even say these characters are living at ground zero, both emotionally and literally. Like most Godzilla films, much of this film is set in Tokyo, which is in the process of rebuilding itself after the war. While not subjected to the devastation of a nuclear blast the way Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, Tokyo looks almost indistinguishable from those cities, utterly flattened by firebombs, a grave year with countless innocents buried beneath the smoldering rubble. But if Japan was ground zero in the immediate aftermath of the war, the sudden appearance of a giant nuclear dinosaur pushes the country to something below even that, minus one if you will. Much like the 1954 original, Godzilla Minus One isn't actually about Godzilla. At least, not really. Sure, on the surface it's the story of a reptilian monster emerging from the sea to wreak havoc in Japan, but at its core, it's about a much more real horror. As everyone and their grandmother knows at this point, Ishiro Honda's classic was a deliberate metaphor for Japan's national trauma in the wake of the US bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a country already on its knees being decimated in a show of raw power by an uncaring behemoth. Minus One is far from the first Godzilla film to go back to this metaphor, but it's the first to explicitly concern the aftermath of the war the way the original did. Rather than focusing on the nuclear bomb itself, Minus One explores the way the war that preceded those bombings had already scared the psyche of the Japanese people. A brutal, protracted conflict that exposed the cruel inequity of Imperial Japan. Godzilla forces the people to reckon with this inequality, representing a physical manifestation of a war not yet over for those who not only survived combat on the battlefield, but the cold indifference of their own leadership. As Yamazaki himself said in an interview with The Verge, whenever Godzilla appears in film, he brings a kind of reflection on nuclear war and any man-made crisis. In post-war Japan, citizens were decimated, survivors everywhere were in desperate need of help, and I wanted audiences to gain an understanding of how Japanese survivors felt after World War II. More than just a stand-in for the nuke, in Minus One, Godzilla represents being on the receiving end of America's military might more broadly. In fact, this might be the most explicitly Godzilla has ever been equated to the United States as a nation, bar maybe Godzilla Raids Against, in which his fight with Angerus can be read as a microcosm of the Cold War Japan found itself caught in the middle of. In the prologue, we learn that Godzilla has been living on the island of Odo for years, more or less coexisting with the local inhabitants inhabitants on the island, and even bringing deep sea fish to the surface for fishermen to collect. Godzilla, much like the United States prior to World War II, was essentially a sleeping giant, a powerful being but largely isolationist, that is, unless provoked. In this way, the Odo sequence of the film is a microcosm of Pearl Harbor, in which a preemptive strike by the Japanese mechanics results in violent retaliation by 
Godzilla. This parallel between Godzilla and the United States is made overt when the mechanics speculate whether Godzilla is some new Yankee weapon. Something that becomes quite literal when Godzilla is made nuclear as the result of US testing at Bikini Atoll. A place it's reasonable to assume Godzilla wouldn't have been had the mechanics not driven him off Odo Island. Here the film suggests that Godzilla is the result of Japan poking the bear. Or I guess I should say lizard. Not, no, not that lizard, just lizard. Like the Japanese military, the mechanics on Odo were ill-equipped to take on such a fearsome opponent, but fearing its potential danger, they attacked with the assumption their aggression would be met with submission. But instead, it unleashed unholy bloodshed made infinitely worse by their adversary's newfound nuclear capabilities. But lest you think the film is letting the Americans off the hook lightly, blaming their destruction of Japan on Japanese provocation, the film very pointedly condemns the asymmetrical nature of America's response to Pearl Harbor. Throughout the film, it's speculated that the newly nuclear Godzilla considers Tokyo a new part of its territory, and that his ceaseless march towards Tokyo is an attempt to claim that territory. Godzilla isn't just an embodiment of American military power, but more specifically, it's asymmetrical retaliation against Japan. Let's be clear, the decision to kick a sleeping giant to deter them from joining the fight was senseless at best, and an act of hubris at worst, but the American response, using the most fearsome weapon ever created to attack a country that was already on its knees twice, was an astronomically unbalanced act of barbarism. And the people who suffered the consequences of that act weren't the people responsible for starting the war, it was innocent civilians. The United States collectively punished Japan for the sins of its government, thinking their suffering would hurt the government by proxy, but they overestimated how much the Japanese government cared about its people. And even if they hadn't, it wouldn't have justified their actions. Godzilla's attack on Ginza, kicking a country while it's down, mirrors the choices of the US government in the final days of the war. The image of Godzilla standing in the shadow of a towering plume of smoke, having laid waste to Ginza, is seared into my brain. The fact that the devastation eclipses even the titanic lizard itself serves to symbolize just how asymmetrical America's reprisals truly were. But while Minus One's exploration of the war's lasting impact on Japan via Godzilla is endlessly compelling, it's not the reason Minus One is such a masterful piece of cinema, or at least it's not the only reason. After all, Godzilla as a metaphor for real world devastation isn't exactly new ground for the series, even if Minus One's meditation on the subject explores this metaphor better than just about any other entries since the original. No, where this film truly shines is in its human characters. Yeah, you heard me right. The human characters in Godzilla Minus One rule. Human characters have long been the chagrin of kaiju films, a necessary evil to drive the plot. Audiences may come to see the monsters, but monsters alone can't carry a film. At least, not the kind of film that's palatable to a mainstream audience, which puts the filmmakers in a tricky position. They need human characters, but they're kinda doomed to be the audience's least favorite part of the movie, at best being a mild distraction from what they really came to see. So what do you do? Well, the answer has typically been to simply treat these characters as audience surrogates, broadly drawn POV characters that can react to the monsters and contextualize their actions without eating into the monster's screen time. But while I'd argue there are plenty of human protagonists in the Godzilla films that I genuinely like, like just about everyone in 2014 Godzilla, yeah, I'm one of the weirdos who didn't get off-put by the fact that Brian Cranston died, I actually thought that was kind of brilliant, the characters in the Godzilla series by and large can't help but feel a little functional most of the time. Their stories are designed to be as unobtrusive as possible, and that mentality has resulted in characters that feel both essential yet superfluous. They're front and center, but it isn't really about them. Miraculously, Minus One manages to avoid this trope. While the human characters are absolutely audience surrogates, they aren't only that. They have fully formed inner lives and interpersonal relationships that are just as compelling as the kaiju action. And perhaps even more importantly, they aren't 
plot devices. The journey these characters go on is just as important to the story as Godzilla, and in fact, they're deeply intertwined. If Godzilla is the embodiment of American aggression in World War II, then each of the three main characters is a byproduct of that aggression. Men broken by asymmetrical warfare that was thrust upon them by a government that barely recognized their humanity. Yoji Akitsu is a jaded veteran who despises his government's indifference to his people's suffering, but has resigned himself to the idea that it will never change. Kenji Noda is an engineer whose brilliant mind was wasted developing weapons of war that prioritized victory over survival. And Koichi Shikishima is a kamikaze pilot whose refusal to follow his orders and die for his country haunts him. Through these three men and their interactions with every character that surrounds them, Minus One delivers an incredibly powerful indictment of the Imperial Japanese government and explores the psychological effects of waging war on behalf of a regime that saw its people as little more than expendable pawns. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Towards the end of the second act, Noda brings this subtext to the forefront, lamenting the Imperial leadership's callous disregard for human life and accusing it of setting its soldiers up for failure by sending them to war against a technologically advanced adversary in flimsy tanks, planes without ejector seats, and little in the way of sustenance. The nation and the Emperor came above all else, and soldiers in the Imperial Army were expected to be little more than obedient cannon fodder to win the war by any means necessary. By the war's end, this dehumanizing edict came to its logical and depressingly literal conclusion by way of the kamikaze pilots, men who were ordered to use their bodies as weapons for the Empire, deliberately flying their planes into enemy infrastructure in a futile attempt to postpone an inevitable defeat. These suicide missions were perversely framed as an honor, the honor of giving one's life to protect Japan. But these deaths weren't to protect Japan, they were a final desperate gasp by a regime that had failed its people and was unwilling to accept defeat. Minus One argues the kamikaze missions were a fundamental betrayal of the Japanese people and humanity itself. Shikishima, the most prominent of the three leads in the film, is defined by this betrayal. But rather than being driven by rigorous indignation, he's suffocated by survivor's guilt. Although he didn't die for what he recognized was a lost cause, he still feels an incredible amount of shame that he didn't. After all, if your job is to die, survival is quite literally failure. This deep-seated guilt is made manifest in his relationships, most notably his relationships with his neighbors. Sumiko, and his brother-in-arms, Sosaku Tachibana. Upon returning to Tokyo after the war, Shikishima discovers his neighborhood has been leveled by incendiary bombs, killing both of his parents as well as his neighbor's young children. But rather than embracing Shikishima and taking solace in their shared grief, Sumiko instinctively blames him for what happened. It turns out, civilians were fed the same lies about honor and sacrifice as the kamikaze pilots. So in Sumiko's eyes, Shikishima's survival is a dishonor tantamount to treason and the reason her family perished. The ingenious cruelty of the way the Japanese government framed the kamikaze missions is how it turned survivors of the war like Shikishima into scapegoats for the Empire's defeat. Lightning rods people's shame and grief that conveniently diverts attention away from the true architects of Japan's degradation, its leaders. Sumiko personifies this attitude, taunting Shikishima as he attempts to find purpose in a life he's been made to feel he doesn't deserve. This anxiety is compounded by his relationship with Tachibana, the only other survivor of the Odo Island attack. Like Sumiko, Tachibana resents Shikishima for surviving. He believes that had Shikishima fired at Godzilla like he was ordered to, their compatriots might have survived. But whether he genuinely believes a plane's machine gun could have actually stopped the rampaging monster or not is less important than the simple fact that he believes Shikishima's inaction was cowardice. To Tachibana, the failure to shoot, regardless of whether it would have worked, was indistinguishable from simply giving up. 
something he already suspects Shikishima had done when he grounded his plane en route to his kamikaze mission, citing technical issues. Issues that Tachibana couldn't find evidence for during his inspection of the craft. To Tachibana, it would be better to die fighting than survive surrendering, a sentiment that reflects the mentality of most of Japan's leadership in the final days of the war. For these men, surrender simply wasn't an option. Japan had never been invaded, nor had it ever lost a war, and the idea of laying down arms while there was still a means to keep fighting? was untenable. There was no honor in cutting their losses, but while this idea of fighting to the last breath is romantic, it's a disastrously inhumane way to fight a war, sacrificing real human lives for the abstract concepts of honor and national pride, things that ultimately mean very little to dead men. But in drawing this parallel between Tachibana's attitude towards surrender and the Japanese leaderships, Minus One suggests that this foolish pride was merely a mask concealing profound guilt, and that the Japanese leadership's reluctance to accept defeat was the result of an unwillingness to accept their own culpability in that defeat. Just as it was easier to continue sending men to their deaths rather than admit they had mishandled the war, preemptively striking Pearl Harbor and not equipping their soldiers well enough, it's easier for Tachibana to blame Shikishima for refusing to fire at Godzilla than to confront his own responsibility in provoking the monster. So in the aftermath of the battle, Tachibana projects his guilt onto Shikishima, a selfish act made physical in the form of family photos of the soldiers who died. In the end, Shikishima is only able to draw Tachibana out of seclusion by recognizing their shared feelings of guilt and prying at it, insinuating their deaths of their comrades were actually his fault to elicit a reaction. The film argues that it's only through the acknowledgement of our shared trauma like this that our wounds can start to heal. Over the course of the film, Shikishima's relationship with Sumiko gradually shifts from spite to genuine affection as she comes to see Shikishima isn't so different from herself. When Shikishima first takes in Noriko, another orphan of the war, and her adopted child, Akiko, Sumiko isn't dismissive of his charity, her words bordering on outright cruelty as she ridicules him for wanting to be the hero now as if it'll make up for not being one before. But as time goes on, Sumiko becomes a part of their little found family, assuming the role of Akiko's aunt and helping to raise her, transforming her bereavement for her children into love for another. Similarly, in seeing how heavily the guilt he had passed on to Shikishima had weighed on him over the years, so much so that he was prepared to kamikaze Godzilla in atonement for his failure to die with his fallen comrades, Tachibana finally recognizes the inhumanity of his judgment and incorporates an ejector seat into his plane, imploring Shikishima to live rather than throw his life away. In the grand scheme of things, Sumiko and Tachibana aren't even a huge part of the movie, but their arcs beautifully mirror the surviving soldiers' real-world relationship with both people of Japan and themselves. As time went on, people started to realize they were all victims of a system that took advantage of them, a system that threw their bodies at a vein in futile conflict and reflected the blame back onto them once it was over. And out of that realization came unity. Likewise, it's only once Shikishima makes peace with Sumiko and Tachibana that he can finally let go of his survivor's guilt and choose to live, beautifully reflecting Japan's move towards pacifism and democratization following the war. However, as important as these two relationships are in exploring the meta-narrative of the film, Shikishima's inability to overcome his survivor's guilt and embrace life is most evident in his relationship with Noriko and Akiko. Although the trio essentially functions as a family for most of the film, Shikishima is unwilling to fully let his guard down and embrace that dynamic. When Noda and Akitsu mistakenly assume Noriko is Shikishima's wife, he's quick to rebuff them. It's obvious he has feelings for her, but he can't allow himself to move on from the war and live his life, so he pushes her away. Likewise, when Akiko refers to him as daddy, he coldly corrects her, insisting he isn't her father. It's not because he doesn't love her or care for her the way a father would, but rather that he doesn't believe he deserves the love and respect that comes with the title. 
Noriko and Akiko represent the life he wants but doesn't think he deserves. There's a cruel irony in the fact that to get over his guilt, Shikishima needs to let people in and embrace life, but his guilt leaves no room for those connections in his heart and mind. His guilt is made even worse when Noriko seemingly dies in Ginza at the hands of Godzilla, the monster he failed to kill. In Shikishima's eyes, it's as if Godzilla has come back to punish him for even considering moving on with his life. He's the embodiment of the war he failed to fight, returning to personally torment him. It's this moment that commits Shikishima to his suicide mission, believing that he alone must destroy Godzilla as penance for his cowardice. And perhaps in a lesser film, this framing would go unchallenged, a kind of Moby Dick tale without the moral, with Shikishima seeking redemption by killing the monster that haunts him. But the brilliance of Minus One is in how it subverts this trope. In almost every other Godzilla film in which Godzilla is the antagonist, the day is saved by either the military or a lone hero. But in Minus One, the government is unwilling to get involved for geopolitical reasons, reflecting the same indifference for its people it exhibited throughout the war, and any individual attempt at heroism are shown to be selfish and self-defeating. Just as it was absurd to expect the tide to turn in the war by torpedoing enemy warships with manned planes, Shikishima's suicide plan is framed as a pointless act of martyrdom and would only hurt the people who love him, re-orphaning Akiko and widowing Noriko, whom he doesn't yet realize survived the Ginza attack. No, instead, it's collective action that saves the day. Instead of operating on a plan drawn up by aloof leaders safely insulated in their bunkers, the plan to take down Godzilla is devised by Noda, one of the people. His plan deliberately prioritizes the safety of the soldiers because he knows what it's like to serve masters who don't care if people doing their dirty work live or die, and he wants no part in it. He tells the war veterans they've recruited for the mission that he can't guarantee their survival, and for that reason, he won't force any of them to do it if they don't want to. And some of them leave, but he can guarantee no one will die as a result of the plan itself. To the soldiers, this is enough, with one man joking that it's more of a chance than they were given in the war. Though Shikishima is the one to deliver the final blow to the monster in this film, flying his plane into the behemoth's mouth in what is hands down one of the most exhilarating moments of the entire year. The silence right before Godzilla is about to unleash his atomic breath, only broken by Shikishima's plane crashing into its mouth. Just, ah, oh, it's so good. Even though the final blow is Shikishima's, allowing him to achieve a semblance of closure for his guilt without having to give his life unnecessarily, it wouldn't have been possible without the assistance of everyone else doing their part. From Noda coming up with the plan to the civilians arriving in their boats to help pull Godzilla to the surface in an almost Dunkirk-like fashion, it's truly a fantastic payoff, uniting the people of Japan to overcome their collective trauma by destroying the embodiment of their suffering. Their victory isn't a redo of the war, as I've seen some people claim, but rather it symbolizes a people letting go of the war, allowing the fight to end in their hearts and minds by showing a way forward together. Nowhere is this way forward more apparent than in Shiru Mizushima, nicknamed The Kid, the youngest crew member on Akitsu's boat. The Kid embodies the generation under those who served in the war, who were raised on the myths created by the Japanese government to justify their actions in the war. His playful banter with Akitsu is genuinely amusing, but reveals his naivete. He's still a boy whose childlike innocence blinds him to the cruel reality of war. One Akitsu is all too aware of. Akitsu lived through the war, served his country, and had his eyes open to just how much of a meaningless pawn he was in the eyes of his government. Shiro can't possibly understand that. But that isn't a bad thing. In a perfect world, we would all be unaware of how willing our government is to sacrifice our lives for its own interests. But unfortunately, for many, that reality is their lived experience. The banter between these two comes to a head 
right before the film's third act when Noda and Akitsu tell the kid he won't be joining them on this mission. The camera tracks two veterans as they walk away, leaving Shiru to scream like a petulant child being denied a toy. To him, he's being denied a chance to prove himself worthy of the honor he feels Noda and Akitsu have earned, but the reality is they aren't taking anything from him. In fact, as Akitsu says, they're giving him the future by sparing him the same trauma they were subjected to. Having fought before, they choose to fight again so that Shiru and his generation won't have to. They're fighting to finally end the war that still hasn't ended in their hearts in the hopes it will break that cycle forever. But while this is a beautiful sentiment, it isn't as black and white as Shiru was wrong for wanting to serve his country. In fact, the movie is all about service to others, but his reasons were wrong. He wanted to serve for the honor it promised, not realizing that honor was an illusion, a carrot dangled by the powers that be to trick people into betraying their own best interests. When Shiru shows up to the battle with the other civilians, it's not for individual glory, but out of solidarity with his people. This moment was so beautiful and so incredibly earned, and just, ah, uh, it's so good. I love it. At the end of the day, this movie isn't about a giant lizard monster. It's about a victimized people overcoming the shame that was unfairly foisted upon them by leaders incapable of taking responsibility. It's a movie about love and life and fighting for things worth saving, about championing people over abstract concepts like honor and nationalism, and about finding the will to live this beautiful and precious life we've each been given a small window to experience. Yes, it's a Godzilla movie, and you get your money's worth of Godzilla mayhem, but it's so so much more than just the spectacle of watching a giant radioactive lizard wreak havoc on a city. In a year where audiences have realized they don't have to settle for less, Godzilla Minus One reminds us that we don't have to. We can have it all, and we deserve it.